Again, I'm glad you're here, glad you're joining us online. Uh, we'll continue this sermon series, and we've got a, a pretty good summer lined up, some pretty interesting movies, and you've got to wonder, how are we going to find a religious theme in some of these movies that are listed? Not necessarily religious movies, not necessarily spiritual, but we can always find things to use for God's kingdom within them. Today's film is a 1981 film, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it introduced the world to Indiana Jones, played by the legendary Harrison Ford. Indiana is a professor by day, but his alter ego is an archaeologist and a treasure hunter. I don't know about you, but I like the treasure hunter themed shows. You know, it's always the thought of American pickers finding something of extreme value hidden in the, in the attic somewhere, you know. Indiana travels looking for lost artifacts, which most of the time involves somebody trying to kill him. And in Raiders of the Lost Ark, he is searching for one of the greatest treasures that's ever been lost in history, the Ark of the Covenant. The film is a race between the Nazis and Indiana to find the Ark. The Nazis want to unlock what they believe to be the supernatural power, and Indiana is trying to stop them. To find the Ark, Indiana must race across the globe, fight with the enemies, unlock hidden clues, and find the secret location of the Ark. But at the heart of the film are some very deep Spiritual questions. Where is the Ark of the Covenant truly lost in history? What is the Ark of the Covenant? And what significance is the Ark of the Covenant? So start with where is it? And to, the answer is the Bible does not say where the Ark of the Covenant is today. History does not say where the Ark is. Now there's lots of unproven theories. Uh, as to where the Ark of the Covenant might be, but this is a historical fact, okay? You can start with this one. The Ark of the Covenant was in Solomon's temple in 586 B.C. 586 years before Christ, it was there in the temple before the Babylonian Empire attacked and conquered G Jerusalem in 586 B.C. The Hebrew people were taken into exile by the Babylonians, and the Ark of the Covenant was never seen again. Most theories believe that someone took the ark somehow, somewhere, and hid it before the Babylonian army came in. There are several theories as to who took the ark, where, but none have been proven. Most historians and scholars believe that the ark was likely destroyed when that invading army came into the temple. It's unlikely that they took it because the Babylonians kept a, a, a very detailed inventory of the things that they took from the temple. Things like the, the golden chalice and, and other things that were in the temple. But it's not mentioned. The Ark of the Covenant is never mentioned in that. Some people believe that the Lord took the Ark of the Covenant up into heaven to be protected from the Babylonians. It says in the uh, Apostle John states this in Revelations eleven nineteen. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen within the temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. So John is seeing in this vision in Revelation that at the second coming of Christ, the ark will be seen again. Where's the ark? This question is not nearly as important as the other two questions. What is the ark? Why is it important? What is the ark? Exodus 25, let's go and see what it is. First, we're going to see that the finest craftsman in all the land was chosen to build the ark. It was detailed in the craftsmanship of it. And I'm going to put an image of it. There it is, of the ark. It's, it's an artist rendition of what it might have looked like. And we're going to leave that up there for just a little bit. The best craftsman said, now I'm going to put this not in cubits or, you know, biblical terminology, but in modern day things, it was uh, about four feet long. Two feet wide, two feet tall. It says, all the, the wood shall be overlaid with pure gold, both inside and outside. Gold-plated hope chest, so to speak. They installed four gold rings. You can see where the poles go through the rings on the picture. 
And those poles were to remain in the ark. They would not be taken from it. Now, those poles were extremely important because you had to move this thing. The people of Israel had to carry it with them when they would travel, so they needed these poles. Now, it's my opinion that the poles were much longer than this picture depicts. Because think about it. Gold-plated box. And it says that the, uh, the, the mercy seat on top, that lid on top, is not considered part of the ark. That's considered the mercy seat laid down on the Ark of the Covenant with those angels, those cherubim facing each other, and that was to be made of solid gold. Even the poles were gold-plated. Gold is very, very heavy. I don't know how many men it would have taken to carry this thing through the desert as they walked with it, but it was heavy. The Old Testament tells us that the commandments of God were there. And the Lord says this in, uh, in verse 21, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony. The testimony is those two stone tablets that the Lord had used his finger to carve out on Mount Sinai, uh, beautifully portrayed in that old, old movie, The Ten Commandments. You know, I don't know if it happened like that, but I like its portrayal. And so inside are those two stone tablets, again, even heavier. And God says, there, above the mercy seat, I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that own the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. This was the place where God would meet his people. Hebrews 9, 4 tells us that there was more than just the, those stone tablets in there. Listen to what else was in there. The ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden urn holding the manna. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Aaron's staff that budded and tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. And I don't know why the writer of Hebrews said we can't talk about this right now. Perhaps because it will be revealed in Revelation. The ark was a symbol of God's mercy and a symbol of his presence being with us. God was with his people then. God cared for his people, God provided for his people, and God protected his people. So why in the world is Hollywood interested in making a movie where the central object has such deep religious symbolism? Hollywood not known for their blazing Christianity and their desire to see the world come to Christ. In the movie Indiana Jones, the Nazis want to use the Ark of the Covenant as a weapon of mass destruction. In fact, the Ark of the Covenant does have a deep biblical history in warfare. The Ark of the Covenant accompanied the Jews through the desert. Through that 40 years of wanderings, after it was made, they carried it everywhere with them. Every time they packed up and left, the Ark was there going with them. When it came time to cross the Jordan River, I want you to go into the Promised Land. You're going to have this country. It's going to be yours. So they send the priest out with the Ark of the Covenant, and they hold it. I'm sure hold it, probably not to set it on the ground, but they hold it in the middle of the Jordan River. And the Jordan River backs up, stops flowing. And the entire nation of Israel, a million people or more, cross on dry ground. Reminds you of another time they crossed on dry ground? What would that be? <coughs> Parting of the Red Sea, that's exactly right. So they've done, he's done it, God has done it again in a miraculous way. And then when they go into the Promised Land, the, the Ark of the Covenant goes with them as they, uh, as they conquer these nations who are pagan, who do not believe in the one true God. The most dramatic demonstration we read about today was in uh, the walls of Jericho came falling down, Joshua 6, 8. And just as Joshua commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. I tell you what, I hadn't really studied the Ark of the Covenant in quite a while, and so I went to BibleGateway.com, and I looked, at, and it gives you a list of every verse in the Bible where the words Ark of the Covenant appear. And I looked through those and read through those, and it's amazing. I mean, we could have a sermon series just on the Ark of the Covenant and what happened with this thing where they followed it. One of the times that got me and I thought was pretty interesting was that after the conquest of the promised land was completed, they take the ark, they take the tabernacle, which is the tent dwelling for the ark, uh, and they take it in there and they put it in there uh, in, in Shiloh until the Israelite army was out fighting the Philistines at one time, a constant enemy of theirs. 
But this time the Philistines won. So somebody had the bright idea, well, the Philistines beat us. Let's go get the Ark of the Covenant and take it in the battle. That'll help us win. It did not. They lost again. The Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. When the word got back to the high priest, he killed over dead right on the spot because the Ark of the Covenant had been captured. So the Philistines take it back to their capital city, Ashdod. Is there an Ashdod, Alabama? I don't know. But they took it to their capital city south of Canaan. They placed it in the temple of their false god they called Dagon. Dagon, Dagon, uh, which was just a statue. So they leave it there. They put the ark in there with the, next to the temple of uh, the false god. They come in the next morning, and this huge statue of Dagon had fell over on its face before the ark of the covenant. Well, they stand it back up. You know, everything's okay. I don't know how this happened. It's weird. And they leave. And the next day they come again. And it says the statue of Dagon fell over before the Ark of the Covenant as if it was worshiping the God of the Ark. And its head came off. And its hands came off. And they said, this ain't good. We don't really want this Ark of the Covenant in the capital city. But we still want to hang on to it. So let's ship it off to another city. Let's ship it off to uh, another city. And, and they did there. And then they, they didn't want to keep it, so they shipped it off to a different city again. And it says that everywhere the ark went, a plague hit that city. A plague. And so it got down that after seven months, the Philistines decided, we don't want this thing anymore. Take it back to Israel. Please take this thing back from us. And they took a bunch of uh, gifts, very expensive gifts, I'm sure, probably gold and silver and any other valuable thing they could find to convince the Israelites to take this thing back. And there's a 20-year history there, but eventually the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the most holy of holies in Solomon's temple. So what is the significance of the Ark of the Covenant? Let's embrace our inner Indiana Jones and see why he was searching for this and what it reveals. Truth number one that we see in the Ark and with the Ark God is with me. I am never alone. If you'd like to fill in those blanks, we're saying that God is with me. He is never alone. The Ark of the Covenant was one of the visible symbols that God was with his people. Wherever the Ark went, the people knew that God is with us because he appeared to them there above the Ark. In fact, Joshua reminds us of this truth as Joshua was about to leave. God reminds Joshua, excuse me, of the truth as they're about to go into the promised land. He says in Joshua 1.9, the Lord said to Joshua, this is my command, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, that's a comforting verse, isn't it? The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The promise he made to Joshua is also given to each one of us today through God's one and his only son, Jesus the Christ. He's with us and we know he's with us. Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross so that the separation between us and God, and we were separated through sin, through original sin in the garden from God. Jesus said in Matthew 28, be sure of this, I will be with you always. To when? To the very end of the age. Jesus never wants you to be alone. Jesus never wants you to feel isolated and lonely. Jesus never wants you to believe that you have to walk through this life and everything that comes at you in this life by yourself. Just as the Ark of the Covenant was a physical reminder to God's people that they were not alone, you and I have a physical reminder that we are not alone. Well, we have our baptism. Some churches will have a baptismal font at the very entrance. And when you walk in, you can dip your finger in the font, make the sign of the cross just to remind you that I am a baptized child of God. We have the Lord's Supper, the physical presence of Jesus in, with, and under the bread and wine. And we have the church. We have the family of faith. We have the support of those who also believe in Christ to remind us that we are never alone. Brings us to truth number two. God sustains me so I have all I need. God sustains me so I have all I need. Anybody ever worried about paying a bill? Any time in your life have you had to worry about paying a bill? Yeah, been there. Yeah. Anybody ever had somebody come to work to take your car because you didn't make a payment? 
been a long time ago, but it, it has happened. Anybody ever concerned where their next meal was coming from? You know, I'm, thankfully, I, I've never really had to worry about the next meal because I can always scrounge up some food somewhere. But right now, is anybody worried about their retirement re investments? Yeah, retirement investments are going way down right now. Anybody worried about the price of gas? Rather stay home than go on a vacation? It's going up. In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was God's symbol that he would provide all they needed. Remember those three things that were in the Ark. What were they? The Ten Commandments, the cup of manna, and the, the staff of Aaron, which I'm not going to really go into the staff of Aaron. And I'm wondering how that staff fit in the four-foot box. You know, was, was it a cane? I'm picturing it to be one of these staffs that's like seven feet tall. Did they cut it in half? Don't know. Doesn't say. But it was in there. But let's talk about the manna for just a minute. In Exodus 16, why a pot of manna? Moses and Israel had left the slavery of Egypt. They're wandering through the desert. And, uh, oh, there's a song. I can't remember who sings it. So it basically says, Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? We had good food in Egypt. Yeah, we were slaves, but at least we ate. And so God says, tell you what, tomorrow I'm going to give you guys something to eat. I'm going to rain down manna from heaven, and it's going to cover the ground like dew. And I want you to go out and gather it up. And uh, actually, you know what manna means? The word itself means? It means what they said when they walked out. What did you say? What is it? They walked out there and said, what is this on the ground? The Lord said, gather it up. So they would gather up a pot of it, just enough for their family Family of two, family of four, whatever they were, they gathered up enough for one day. Give me this day my daily bread. And they would eat it. Some people got a little greedy. Some people were a little worried, didn't trust God. So they said, I'm going to gather up enough for at least a couple of days. Second day, the stuff rotted. Rotted. No good the second day. However, when it came to the day before the Sabbath, or the day of the Sabbath, the Lord said, go ahead and gather up enough for two days. And they're thinking, man, this stuff rots on the second day. I don't know about this. But it did not rot. For the Sabbath. So they didn't have to work. They didn't have to gather stuff on the Sabbath. Each day God provided food from heaven. Their daily bread. Each day the people would go out and pick up just what they needed. On the sixth day they said he will gather their food. And when they prepare it there will be twice as much as usual. The pot of manna in the ark was a constant symbol that God provides. And today God wants us to use the ark to remind us that he still provides for us and we still provide for people in the community through our food pantry what do you need from God today what do you need from God today maybe it's emotional encouragement life has been hard lately for a lot of people maybe you need spiritual uplifting when you feel disconnected or far from God, don't you, don't you want to be drawn back in closer? You can feel that closeness. Maybe you need financial provision. Inflation has eaten away at the little margin we had for security. Maybe you're just tired and you need physical strength. Whatever you need today, God wants you to see Jesus as the bread of life. He is our manna from heaven to provide all that we need. And he's inviting you today. He's inviting you to trust that he provides. And I think on this Father's Day weekend, we as men need to learn that he provides and he will take care of our families, that he will keep us in protection, that he will forgive and release us from all the shame and guilt that we have. He'll be the door that we need to go through. Truth number three, God protects me, so I'm not afraid. When the Israelites left Egypt, they were free. We're not slaves anymore, we're free, but they were defenseless. They were builders and farmers and such. They were not warriors, and they did not have a, an army, so to speak. They had no military experience at that time in history. But as they marched through the wilderness, the ark went before them as a sign of God's protection. God was with them. And God made a promise to them in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4, For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies, and he will give you victory. Just like the Israelites, everyday followers of Jesus today, we're going to face demons. You may ever face demons. Maybe I haven't seen one like you'd see on the movies, but I've had some demons come at me. I know it's straight from the pit of hell because they wanted to trip me up and make me fall. There's temptation at work. There's the desires of the flesh. There's that need for control. I want to be in control. 
Sometimes we even go through a season of life where we just question our own faith. Is God real? Is there a heaven? There's an enticement of an idol. Lots of different idols out there that we can put our faith in and our desires toward. And probably one that maybe all of us have felt is, have you ever had a time where you were really disappointed with God? It had to be his doing what we're going through right now. But God says you don't have to be afraid because God has defeated your enemies. The number one enemy of the people of God is sin, death, and the devil. He defeated sin by taking all that sin on himself in the cross of Calvary. He defeated death by rising from the grave on the third day. He is risen. He is risen that was weak. He is risen. He really is risen. And that's how we know that we're going to rise again. He defeated the devil by defeating his plan to rule the world. Because God had forgiven you, God has made you holy. In the final scene of the Raiders from the Lost Ark, very dramatic scene, by the way, it's pretty gruesome as the visual, visual representation of the angel of death comes up out of the Ark of the Covenant and brings death to everyone. But Indiana told Mary, close your eyes, don't look. Don't look at it. And they were kept safe. He brings death to those who are unholy, meaning have no faith in what his son did for us. The ark was always to be hidden from us, kept in the holy of holies, in both the tabernacle, the tent that traveled, and when Solomon built the temple, he was kept in the holy of holies there. The ark of the covenant was hid there, hidden from everyone except the high priest. In fact, it was so holy that there was a large curtain dividing the place of the holy of holies, the most holy, from the regular part of the temple. And when Jesus passed, it says the curtain was torn. There's no longer separation between us and God the Father. Listen to Hebrews 10. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, that would be Jesus, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Jesus is the new ark. Jesus is the new covenant. And he made a way for me and he made a way for you. We don't have to be afraid because through Jesus we have full access to the Father. We're probably, very few of us going to have adventures like Indiana Jones had. But what we do have is a high calling to be men of God this Father's Day. To be men of God who are the spiritual leaders of our homes. We're called to be men who love God men who love our families, and men who serve our neighbor. May we do so through the power of the strength of our Ark of the Covenant, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.